Welcome back to another edition of the Edge Podcast. Publisher Brendan Slaughter here for BeaversEdge.com. Joined by KAGO radio host and Beaver's Edge writer TJ Matthewson. We're back here for the Rivalry Week edition of the podcast as Oregon State is set to host Oregon at Reeser Stadium this Saturday. TJ and, TJ and I are coming to you uh, just before Thanksgiving. Hope you guys have a wonderful holiday or having a wonderful holiday as you're uh, watching this podcast. Again, pleased to uh, welcome you back to the Edge Podcast, Brennan Slaughter, TJ Matthewson. TJ, what's up, my man? You ready to uh, eat well this week? I am going to eat well. My parents yeah. are going to be down here in uh, the Corvallis, Albany area. Very nice. Because it is a busy weekend for us here in the media with yes. uh, with the PK. Very. PK Legacy Series Thursday, Friday, Sunday, uh, and the rivalry game on Saturday. So it should be should be entertaining. I'm very much looking forward to Saturday's game. I'm well. I'm trying to think back to the the last point, probably 2009, the last time these two teams were about as even as they are right now. So it should be really just a fabulous game. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. We're obviously going to get into the game itself in, in extreme detail throughout the course of this podcast. But uh, as as TJ, you know, had just mentioned, you know, it's been a long time since we've had a, a, a game between Oregon State and Oregon that uh, has this much magnitude to it. And, you know, you go back to 2012, the last time that both teams were ranked. But as TJ alluded to, that was an unbelievable Oregon team that, you know, came up just short of being able to play in the national championship that year doesn't bother me all that much but regardless that was a really good Oregon team and uh, that game ended up being you know somewhat lopsided by Oregon's favor so yeah you have to go back to uh, you know 2013 was a really good game in the series but both teams weren't ranked so you go back to 2009 as you mentioned the war for the roses back then winner went to the Rose Bowl and uh, Oregon State came up just short in that game uh, TJ 2008 2009 will definitely uh, stand in Beaver fans' memory and not such a great way as the Beavers were uh, just one win away from the Rose Bowl two years in a row. And it was those guys from down south that uh, stopped him up just short. Not quite that much at stake this weekend for the Beavers, but a spot in the conference championship game on the line for Oregon. And then the potential for Oregon State to win this game, if they were to win, to really throw a wrench into the bowl plans and potentially just burst through their Sun Bowl glass ceiling that I like to say right now if they win this game. So a lot on the line, but TJ, let's go ahead and just kind of put a bow tie on that Arizona State game from last week. A complete dismantling. 31 mm-hmm. to 7. Uh, we talked about it. Them avoiding the trap game. Not a whole lot we're going to dive into uh, with that matchup because the score in the game itself is pretty self-explanatory and we want to make sure to have ultimate Civil War coverage this week. I'm not sure how many times I'll mention that this podcast. We'll see. <laughs> De- depends on uh, Depends on how the podcast goes, but uh, an awesome win last week, TJ, for Oregon State as they go down to Tempe, a place we talked about. You know, not a lot of success, a lot of ghosts down there, and uh, just kind of ho-hum, casually take care of business, get on the plane, and we're probably back in Corvallis with uh, dinner and uh, film study of that Oregon-Utah game, don't you think? The, the game, I guess at least in the first half, maybe you had a little inkling that it could go south in the second half. Sure. Until the, you know, the final possession of the first half, first possession of the second half, the Beavers, they go two for one in that right. segment. And I really think, you know, so that it put a bow tie on this game. And right. that was something you just kind of wanted to see them just really just go out there and execute something on the road this year. Even in games where they've, you know, outmatched their opponents like they did against Stanford. Right. Wasn't quite that. But you know, outside of the first quarter and a half, I mean, the Beavers just really controlled the outside of this game with one of their, you know, most injured rosters that they've had last week. Uh, right. A number of guys ruled out for the game. Jam Griffin led the game after just two carries yeah. last week, um, last weekend. But, you know, I really did like what I see. The, the offense was in control. The defense didn't have that sort of lull game which right. could always happen in a trap game where you're just not really as focused. You're looking forward to Bo Nix and company the next week, and you're facing a team that you're pretty heavily favored to beat and that's you know well on their way to having a new head coach here in about a week right. and a half, you would think. So the opportunity was there for a letdown, and they didn't let that happen. And I'm going to start, and I'm going to give credit to Ben Goldbranson, who played, yeah. a, he played a very good complimentary game. He was well accurate, and most importantly, 
I don't know why it took this long. He used his legs to extend yeah. plays and to Agreed. get first down, something that makes every good quarterback nowadays better. Yeah, without question. And, and you know, you summed it up perfectly, TJ. I mean, honestly, there's not a whole lot more I can add to that myself. But, no, I mean, I think Ben – I mean – not even close. I understand he'd won games against Colorado, Washington State, and even Stanford. That was Ben's best performance of the year. When you consider everything that went into it, the fact that it was a road game, the fact that you know he was only a couple weeks removed from playing pretty poorly on the road against Washington, I, I think that showed Ben Goldbrunson's resiliency. I think it showed his toughness, and I think it shows, TJ, most importantly, his teammates are starting to believe in him. And flash forward, if, you know, not even the Washington game – but, you know, early on, you go back to that Utah game, you know, maybe some moments here and there where his pocket presence wasn't great. He didn't necessarily look like he was in full command of the offense. He looked like he was in full command of the offense against Arizona State. I think there's still going to be some limitations to what he can do just based on being a first-year starter, quote-unquote, in the system. Uh, but he's getting better each week. You have to credit to – you have to credit the kid for – you know, going into film study each week, attacking it and getting better because he progressively has been improving. And perhaps most importantly, TJ, he doesn't um, turn over the ball, right? So only three interceptions on the year. And I believe two of those came from uh, came in the Utah game. And uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on uh, on the other one at the moment. Uh, uh, if you can, uh, if, if it comes to you, TJ, uh, let, let me know. I want, was it, I, no, man, was, it, was it in a Colorado game or was that a fumble? It, it might, as I'm trying to think, I'll have to look it up uh, when, when, when you're making your point. But just to kind of put that point on, I, I think he's just, he's grown. And seeing that progression, it's not like he's a guy who got down on himself like after the Washington game and it's like, well, you know, that, that stinks and, you know, get in your feelings, so to speak. No, he just came back, you know, and to help dismantle Cal, built off that game, didn't get too high, and, you know, went on the road against Arizona State and played well too. So I think when you consider all those factors, I think he's really grown before our eyes. And now when you step back and realize he's played more than Chance Nolan this year, you're like, it's hard to, you know, hard to realize in that, right. in that so, sense. So in that context, I, I think, you know, you, you give him credit and I'm excited to see what he's going to do against Oregon this weekend, TJ, because um, you know, he is playing like, this is as confident as I felt about Ben going into a game all year. And luckily for him, he's not going to be facing the toughest defense in the world, no. the Ducks, on Saturday. Their defense has struggled this year. The Cam Rising game on Saturday that he had against them, three interceptions, 170 yards, that's the outlier uh, yeah. against this Oregon defense this year. That That's probably the best that unit had played all year as well. So, I don't know, it could be a, a hot hand versus a hot hand. Uh, I, right. I'm not, not really a film guy, so I don't know where exactly the little details on that duck defense that we're doing better against Cam Rising. Right. Will I mean, they do the from, same against Ben? From, I'm not sure, but but what I liked most about yeah. Ben's performance is the mid-level throws. That deep yes. that that the deep passing is not there. That so once Chance went down, that part of the playbook is essentially gone now. Yeah. But it is. I really liked what I saw in the mid-levels. The 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 the, the 10 to 20 yard downfield throws and yeah. I thought he did a good job of that and he was choosing the right guys to throw to and again also getting Jack Belling back into the mix yes. he hadn't yeah. heard Jack Belling's name much in the last couple of weeks but he finally he got a touchdown and he got a couple yeah. other you know receptions in there what was Jack Belling's uh final line here three receptions 74 yards so he was able to you know get Belling some some downfield throws and let his tight end run and I think Jack has a good opportunity to be a big key in this offense come Saturday. Yeah, that's a good point uh, with Velling, and I was able to look it up just to correct myself. He had the uh, interception against Washington State. So he had the two against Utah and then the one against oh, uh, uh, Washington State. The game State. I didn't watch. Yeah, like honestly, it slipped my yeah. mind too, uh, you know, like because he'd been so efficient and clean with the ball. You know, you're talking now one, two, three, four straight games uh, without an interception. And TJ, we go back to – you know, not to put that all on Chance Nolan, but we talk about how the year kind of started, you know, against the uh, USC and and uh, and Utah with those two games between Ben and Chance having a combined, you know, eight interceptions. It was rough. So I think that part of the progression and the improvement in the offense is a big reason why Oregon State's winning. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the wheels. I really like seeing Ben Gobranson be able to uh, showcase that running ability a little bit. And then, like you said, the the 10 to 20 yard like out routes. He hit Silas Bolden several times, hit Tyjon Lindsay several times. We didn't see Trayshawn Harrison get as involved as much in this game. And I think that partially is due to the fact of what you were saying, TJ, is that I think Trayshawn Harrison is best utilized kind of as that downfield threat. Mm -hmm. You know, not to say he hasn't, you know, he's scored one of his better touchdowns this year on a wide receiver screen at the line of scrimmage. So I don't want to say he's only a deep receiver, but I think that's his strength, so to speak. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think, you know, maybe, maybe Oregon State's just been vanilla, TJ. Maybe they're going to dial up the deep, the deep balls against Oregon if they feel an opportunity's there. But yeah. just to kind of put it, just to kind of uh, put a point on that error or put a close in the Arizona State game and transition over to Oregon, I thought that was by far and away Oregon State's most efficient game uh, on the road this season, obviously. And, you know, Oregon State should feel really good about where they were, you know, where they are heading into this week. And I think they are. TJ, you obviously talked to the group on uh, Tuesday and then Wednesday this week, both the offense and the defense. And you seem you mentioned to me, and obviously you can tell from watching the videos yourself, spirits are high. Yeah, they were pretty high, uh, especially today here on Wednesday. We talked to Omar and Kyrie. Kyrie's always yeah. great to talk to. I mean, Kyrie's he's, great, uh, yeah. He's always he smiling. He, he's, he, lo- he loves talking to me, which – I love Kyrie, but I mean, he, can't well, sit, be, he can't stand still. He doesn't stand. He doesn't really. He's not a. Like, he's a. He's a mover over. when he talks. But yeah. I love Kyrie. Love Kyrie. But it, it was good. It was. Uh, it might have helped a little bit. There was a little bit of Thanksgiving festivity. Uh, the guys sure. at uh, at KVAL had a, had a question for both offense and defense of yep. what position group is which Thanksgiving mm-hmm. side. Mm-hmm. Which I thought we got some interesting one. Omar said that the linebacker group was the mac and cheese, and then Kyrie oh, said it was the turkey. Yeah, so a, a little bit of variance there uh, of what you would decide. How did, how did you like good choices? Uh, how did you like Ben on Tuesday saying the offensive line is the stuffing? That's all I'm going to name. I love it, man. No, he I said they it. were the turkey. No, he said they were oh, the turkey. The turkey. The turkey. Excuse. Okay, and I agree me. with Ben. I, yeah. I agree. I mean, it, just you left should, it all to the line. I think I in, generally, I in generally, in generally, in on both sides of the football, the trenches are the turkey because they. If you have I bad agree. trench play. That yeah. ruins it ruins the whole offense, ruins the whole defense. If you have bad turkey, it ruins Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> quick take: you don't need to eat turkey on Thanksgiving. It's tradition, but you don't have to eat turkey. If there's better meat out there, you can absolutely go buy and eat it, and you shouldn't feel bad about it. That's my yeah. that's my opinion on that subject. Yeah, I think we could definitely uh, take a quick sidebar before we go into uh, the full uh, mm-hmm. uh, Oregon Oregon State Civil War coverage. I mean, I as someone who maybe a hot take here doesn't care for turkey we we do other things at my house mm-hmm. we've got uh we have some turkey but we've also got some some cornish game hens i've had ham before mm. at thanksgiving so you know me i'm a chicken guy even though it, it's just got to be a bird right just a bird right? right i don't even think it needs to be a bird if you want to have steak on thanksgiving i mean ah, go for who's it gonna tell you not to i mean steak is probably on discount because everyone's buying turkeys right That's we're, true. we're, we're true. here we're here to we're here to be smart we're not here to we're not here to to just follow everything in. If they right. ran out of turkeys and this beautiful filet mignon is just sitting there yeah, on right, the shelf right. next to it, I mean, right. you can't let a good piece of meat like that go to waste. I oh, mean, yeah. what, are, what no. are we talking about? Steak goes well with mashed potatoes, mac and cheese, like everything else you have on the table, Bingo. it goes well with it. Like, yeah. there's yeah. no reason not to not to, not to to entertain the idea. Because <laughs> I'm not, my family's not even one that has had turkey every year, like, like yeah. yours. We don't have turkey every year. We'll have turkey this year. But yeah, like and as an every year thing, my brother is yeah. having Korean barbecue for Thanksgiving this year. And Dude. honestly, I'm kind of yeah. jealous because Korean barbecue is really good. Yeah. But- you know, I'm I'm I, you know, my, my final point on this, because everything you just said is so relatable, TJ. But I consider myself to be a little bit of a of a, you know, of a new tradition setter. So, no, just because you've done this for this many years, I'm like. Why not? So when I was an adult, I'm like, I'm going to do Thanksgiving this way or this way or, you know, so on and so forth. But I think as long as you're around people that you care about, people you're thankful for, just right. got any kind of good food, man. Just fill right. up that table. That is, that is what all. Thanksgiving is that, about. That is yeah. what. It, yeah, exactly. It's about the. It is more about the people and yep. and less about the food. The food is, you know. As yeah. long as you have a full belly sitting on the couch watching the NFL on Thursday, I mean, I exactly. think that's really all people care about. 
Yeah, falling into the food coma. That's really it. So because we know we right. all know that after the first round, we're all going to be passing out on the couch, taking naps, and then waking up and going back for seconds. But no, uh, it's it's going to be exciting. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to having some good eats this week. And you know, obviously, uh, Oregon, Oregon State will be uh, partaking in their various uh, team meals beforehand as well. But you know, getting into the game itself, TJ. You know, kind of you know diving right into this matchup. There's a lot to unpack and, you know, a lot to kind of dive into. Uh, I kind of want to start by just talking about a couple things that stood out to me and make sure to head over to beaversedge.com if you haven't read our story, uh, a closer look at Oregon as we kind of dive into the nuts and bolts of what makes Oregon tick this year. Two things that stand out to me. One, it's that Oregon State's or Oregon's offense is a little better than Oregon State's. and And on that same point, Oregon State's defense, a little better than Oregon's. And then number two. Just a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. And then number two, you've got – let's see here. I want to make sure I have it correctly. So, Oregon, in their road games this year, they faced in Pac-12 play Washington State, Arizona, Cal, Colorado. The combined record of those four teams, TJ, 16 and 28. Oregon has not played a team like Oregon State in an environment that Oregon State will bring since Georgia. And that's not a hot take. That's not. And the only team with a winning record of that bunch was Washington State, and they almost lost that game. Uh It was close. Uh They needed a miraculous fourth quarter to come back and win. And it's not just the home slate. It's not just the away slate, which that was my big takeaway, too. They have not played in any sort of intimidating road environment. Since uh, Georgia. By any measure. No, since Georgia. Georgia. And what was the score of that game, Brennan? 40, 49 to three, if I remember correctly. Right. Okay. Right? There we go. Yeah, yes. Yeah, sure yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. not just that. Here you can say it again the, if you want. You, you can say it again if you want. <laughs> Forty-nine to three. Okay. So yeah. it's not just that. So this offense for Oregon has been great this year. They have averaged yeah. over forty points a game. They are among the best in the country in yards per play. They're the third best offense in yards per play. They're right. the um, let's see, passing efficiency. They're eighth. Uh, yards per carry they're third so they're great running and passing mm-hmm. the ball efficiently you know and it all comes down to Bo Nix the guy who probably will be in New York for the Heisman conversation especially if he plays yeah. well on Saturday however let's take a look at some of these defenses Oregon has faced ranked by yards per play allowed which is I think the best way to measure a defense how are you on an efficiency basis defending per play so just to note, Oregon State ranks 33rd nationally in yards per play. Georgia is 12th. Those are the two teams on each end of Oregon's schedule. Here's right. all the teams in the middle of that schedule, not counting Eastern Washington because they're an FCS team. BYU, 111. Washington Ooh. State, 43rd. Stanford, 126th. Arizona, 124th. UCLA, Ooh. 79th. Cal, 100th. Colorado, 130th. Washington, 86. Utah, I was really surprised by this, 92nd. Yeah. That is more teams over 100 than under on their schedule this year. So, I think their offense, while two things can be true, is very good and has faced an incredibly soft schedule this year of opposing defenses. And this Agreed. Oregon State defense will be the first good defense they have played by yards per play since September. And that's including it's a long Utah. time. That's including I, Utah. I was yeah. shocked how bad Utah's defense was. 90 yeah, and second? That, yeah, and that's 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 in terms of yards per play we're talking about, right? right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's definitely a bit surprising and that's a great stat poll. Um because, you know, again, I don't want to not give, you know, I don't want to sit here and be a complete Oregon State homer and say that, you know, Oregon didn't deserve to win last week because I think, you know, I think Bo Nix toughed it out. And I think, you know, they, they, they buckled down and got the win, but Utah played horribly. And you look at Cam rising, Cam rising hadn't thrown three picks in his collegiate career, TJ. I don't know if I credit that all the Oregon's defense. I think Utah just black kind of stinks on offense right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with that, like not to say Oregon state is world beaters on offense because they've had their limitations we've talked about it but i think if oregon state can get that ground game going and then work and mix in the pass with ben and hit some shots utah didn't look like they could hit anybody other than um uh, dalton kincaid 
in the passing game at all. What's kind of weird, if we look at this Oregon defense, I mean, yards per play, they're awful. They are 109th, 109th. And there was a stat after the Washington game that it's pro- I don't think it's updated, but after the Washington game at least, there were only, I think, two schools, Vanderbilt and Duke, that were giving up more yards per play to winning teams mm. than the Oregon Ducks. And I think it was right around nine and a half. Nine yeah. and a half. That is a first down every time you snap the ball. So what first is that to, to winning teams is what you're saying. So in yes. this case, so they to, winning record. Yeah. So Washington that would be, state, Georgia, Washington. Yeah. And then you got UCLA in there. UCLA uh, and, and well, it was UW. before Utah. Okay. So before Utah got, and then uh, throw UW in there as UW's obviously. Right, exactly. UW Utah. was the one that yeah. sort of emphasized that the most, the two passing touchdowns yep. Michael Penix had were both yep. over 60 yards. Yeah, and and you look, and I think, again, I think Oregon, I think it was good for, you know, not necessarily good for Oregon to, um, you know, but just as far as Oregon State specifically in the matchup, you know, Oregon was really upset after that loss to Utah or loss to Washington, rightfully so. I think it was, it's going to benefit Oregon State that Oregon played a game after that and then now comes into Oregon State and it's not like, hey, they lost to Washington last week here, they come into the, you know, the game against Oregon State, but Again, all those stats tell me, and you know, we've been talking about it on the board uh, this week too, with some of the stats and whatnot. All those stats, you know, they're they they are all um, super, you know, intriguing on both sides, TJ. But how much of this being a rivalry game do you have to just go stats out the window? Throw it out. Yeah, you know, like, I, th- I think a good amount. Right? I think a good amount because I think the biggest matchup in this game, as it is most games, are the quarterbacks. Mm. When we looked at this matchup two weeks ago, I think. Uh, just briefly, I'm sitting here and Ben's still starting, uh, coming off the UW game and thinking it's like, you're not beating the Ducks with that version of Ben. Right. Like, you're not. No, I'm sorry. I'm, no, but objectively, it's true. Two things have happened since then. He played his best game as a as a collegiate last week on Saturday. And Bo Nix's game is essentially cut in half because he can't yep. move. Yep. He was not moving very well on Saturday. He has 14 rushing touchdowns this year. That is seventh nationally amongst all players. Players, yeah, not just quarterbacks. Running backs, too. (laughs) All players, 14 rushing touchdowns. And he was able to show his legs a little bit on on that last drive. He got a first down with his legs, the only time he really ran all game. But that's such a big part of his game. If you take that away from him, you know, that's a big part of why he's a Heisman Trophy uh, finalist, most likely, uh, coming up here in December in New York. So if you take that away from him, it really levels the playing field. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, I'm pretty sure I don't have the exact number in front of my head or in front of my in front of me, TJ, but I'm pretty sure that 14 rushing touchdowns is more than any single Oregon. Yeah, I don't even I think Coletto leads the way with like 12 if I'm uh, don't uh, don't check me on that. But I think it's somewhere right around there. So that's impressive. That's extremely impressive uh, uh, from Bo Nix. And, you know, like I said, I, you got to give a dude credit, right? And, you know, objectively sitting here looking at his numbers. Yeah, he probably does belong to or belong to be invited to the Heisman ceremony. You know, with the numbers he's put up this year, the kind of redemption story he had. Don't get me wrong. You know, um, you know, I, I Col- think Coletto uh, has six. Right okay, so how, okay, so how six. Even- Damian leads the way with seven rushing and then passing. I mean. I mean, Ben I has Coletta eight. Had... In- interesting. No, I thought Coletto was up to uh, was up to almost double digit touchdowns, but maybe not yet. Uh, obviously, uh, nope. uh, yeah, that's interesting. No, but... Nobody in Oregon State is double digit passing, receiving, or rushing touchdowns. Interesting. Yeah, that kind of just shows the story again from Oregon State. But you know, to kind of put that point on Bo, I completely agree with you, and I think you know, I think regardless of how he plays against Oregon State, I think he'll probably still get an invite just based on how it's shaking. I don't think he'll win. I think Oregon would have needed to be a national championship contender to win. Yeah, it's, pro- it's, probably, think- Caleb, it's probably Caleb Williams now, you would think. Caleb Williams, maybe after after, CJ... after After watching that performance in the Rose yeah. Bowl on yeah. Saturday, I, I, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with Caleb Williams winning the award. But you know, great you, for you the know, conference that they're going to get two guys – there to the there to uh there to New York City probably no big deal I don't think uh, I don't think Caleb Williams would have been invited if you know his offensive lineman didn't have to give him a push for a first down against Oregon right, State but, right right you know right. neither here nor there just an observation but uh, you know it's uh uh going back to to Nick's as you said his 
ankle injury, TJ, is everything in this game. The mm-hmm. same kind of a way that we talked a couple weeks ago how it didn't end up happening, but how the conditions could have completely affected Michael Penix's ability to throw the football and kind of evened up that game and it didn't end up happening. In a different way, this has that same kind of totality aspect to it. Because of his ankle, and again, it might be slightly better than last week, but anyone who's had a sprain, a high ankle sprain, I'm not sure exactly where in the ankle it is, but... Dan Lanning is not very... uh, Doesn't like to say much coming to injuries. His usual words are not not talking about injuries. I mean, in all due respect, Jonathan's only a little bit better. Just Just a little bit, but he'll at least tell you if the guy would attempt to practice this week. That's fair. That's fair. At least he'll, at least he'll go, he'll, at least he'll go that far, but no, it's college football injury reporting amongst coaches these days. Don't even get me started. It is a nightmare. Make it like the NFL, but you know, it. um, you know, I think him having that ankle and TJ, any, you, you know, anyone who's had an ankle sprain in their life knows that it doesn't really get better until you just get off of it for about three, four weeks. So Mm -hmm. could Bo be back to healthy by their bowl game? most likely, but he's still going to be hampered in this game, regardless of even if it's improved a little bit. And I think you're going to see Trent Bray and this Oregon State defense really, really try to dial up pressure and go back to early in the year, TJ, when we were talking about on the podcast how, you know, Trent Bray and his defense maybe wanting to be overly aggressive and maybe be even willing to let that big play happen or, you know, wanting to play more on the aggressive side of you know, defense, I wouldn't put it past him to, you know, within the first few minutes of the game, send an all out blitz trying to put him on, you know, trying to get him on the ground and have him feeling that pressure right away. Because I think how good Bo Nix is in this game, I think is going to determine mm-hmm. whether or not Oregon State can win. And I think what's really important in that is Oregon does not give up sacks. They have allowed no, three not sacks this year, three total. Yep. Sacks aren't all an offensive line thing, but a, a good chunk of yeah. it is their it's offensive impressive. line. It helps when you have a very mobile quarterback like Knicks, and it's also important to have a really good pocket presence as well to know when to throw the ball, when to run, uh, and when to just step up and right. you know shift around, move just move away from the defense. I didn't get to you know watch quite as much to see how Bo Nix's pocket presence is when he can't run around last week. Right. But nonetheless, that number looms large. Three sacks all season long. It's yes, going to be it hard to get this guy on the ground. Pressure isn't all about getting the guy on the ground. You can still disrupt him. You can jump in passing lanes, et cetera, it's et true. cetera. But if they can't get Bo Nix on the ground on Saturday, that is it's, – it's an issue because teams haven't gotten him on the ground this year, and he has shredded them, absolutely shredded them. Yeah, and I think that's going to be – that is Oregon State's massive key on that side of the ball is getting pressure on Bo Nix. Uh, you know, I think resp- you know, I think Oregon's got, you know, good players, the skill position. Obviously, they always do. They're Oregon. They're going to have fast guys. They're going to have talented guys. That's just who Oregon is, right? But I think if you can zero in on one matchup, if Oregon State and particularly, you know, Trent Bray, they can dial up some exotic blitzes. And then uh, on the injury front, TJ, particularly Alex Austin and Jaden Grant, could be massive. Uh, their statuses, you know, obviously we'll know they're probably going to be more like a game time decision. Having those two corners, you know, Grant plays safety, but essentially two de- t- two defensive backs, excuse me. Uh, their statuses will be absolutely key to watch this week. And then flipping it to the offense, I think, you know, Oregon State's key is going to be staying on the field, sustaining drives, you know, not turning the ball over, having really long time consuming drives that have, you know, multiple Damian Martinez runs, the Ben Goldbrunson passes that we saw a week ago, just wearing down, you know, an Oregon defense and keeping Bo Nix and that offense on the sidelines. That's your bet. Your best uh, defense in this case is offense being your own. And I think if Oregon state can do that, TJ, they'll be right in this matchup. I mean, just looking at the numbers, Vegas agrees. Uh, Oregon state is a three point underdog right now. That's almost a pick em game. So this game really could go either way and make sure to, you know, check back in later in the week for predictions. TJ still got a perfect record yeah. on the line. Yeah. And, I st- uh, I'm still up I'm in excited. the air. <laughs> I'm excited for this one, but yeah, I mean, what to, offensively TJ, what are the keys uh, for you uh, this week uh, for Oregon state? What do they need to do on offense to come out victorious or put themselves in a good spot? 
it's been nice to see Damian really emerge these last few weeks. Five straight stud. 100 yard games, but you need a healthier running back room. I think. Yes. You, I, Deshaun Fenwick, I think you'd want him back this week because the drop off from Damian to Isaiah Newell and such, like it just, just it, it's, it's now, a bit, it's now. a bit steeper. It's it, for yeah, now. for now, it, yeah. it's like a bit steeper than the drop off from Damian to Deshaun Fenwick. So I think or it'd jamming. be really important that you, yeah, exactly. But it doesn't sound like Jim is going to play this week. I think we're still a maybe on that, but yeah, I mean, he left and he didn't come here. It wasn't even a question if he was coming back last week. So yeah, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to see on that. Cause I think that'd be, you know, you want to keep Damian fresh. You don't want to run him 35 times. I mean, the right. Beavers ran the ball 42 times against ASU. They ran the ball nearly 60, right. 70% of the time against the Sun Devils. And I would imagine they would try and go towards that a little bit uh, with Oregon. I, I was shocked. Like Oregon's run defense honestly been pretty good in overall you know yardage I... allowed. But I think yeah. a lot of that, uh, I'm going to be honest, a lot of that is probably them being ahead in so many games. I mean, 22nd nationally in rushing defense. But they're fifty eighth right. in yards per carry allowed. So, you it, know, there's a little bit little bit of a balance there. Yeah. If that's a good point in the running back room. And and again, like I said, Isaiah Newell just hasn't had the opportunity, right? So it's mm-hmm. like we don't know because he was buried on the depth chart. I think he does have some talent uh, at the spot, but you know, it's it'll be interesting to see. We kind of saw Jonathan Smith. I can't remember if it was this press conference on Monday or the previous one, but one of the last two, he kind of was a little coy talking about Trey Lowe getting back in the mix. And I think that's kind of Oregon State's yeah, secret we didn't weapon. See yeah, I think we, we didn't see him on Saturday, I don't think. No, we didn't. He, pl- he played, let's see, I have the, I said, I believe he logged a couple snaps, but let me confirm that real quick. Um, I think it was just kind of more of, yeah, so played four snaps after playing wow, two. Okay. The week before <laughs> progress. So, <laughs> so what I see with that, and maybe I'm way off on this kind of my little hot take to close out the podcast. What if, you know, maybe one of those guys, in the running back room goes, you mentioned jam and uh, Fenwick are both questionable. We'll see later in the week. Maybe one goes and one doesn't. Oregon has zero tape on Trey low this year, TJ yeah. zero. And maybe outside of the Boise game, but that was a long time ago. So, you know, Trey low, uh, I offense think has could, changed a lot since then. Right. And I think Trey Lowe could be a little bit of kind of that sneaky, you know, hey, Damien's our first and second down guy. Trey's ready to get back into the third down role. And we saw him break some big runs last year. He's got the ability, but he's a guy I'm keeping an eye on on that running back room just because he's kind of getting back to full health as those other guys are a little beat up. So that's that's a position to watch. And then, um, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, I think tight end play is going to be important, too. You gotta get, you know, you, you gotta get Jack Velling it, with uh, uh, with the ball in space because I think there could be some matchups to be had uh, there in the secondary. Yeah, there will be. I'm Dalton Kincaid had a really good game last week. I think exactly. he had nearly a hundred yards. I think eleven receptions. It was either nine or eleven receptions. I can't remember yeah. which one, but he had a good game. He was nearly at a hundred yards. So there is opportunity there mm-hmm. for, for tight ends. The problem is again, I just say evaluating Oregon's defense against right. you know. Quality offenses. It hasn't happened. It happened against UCLA, and that's about it, right? right. There hasn't been much, uh, so, unless you want to go back and watch the Georgia game where, where Brock Bowers and I think Darnell Washington really just yeah. shredded them uh, did. Yep. as two yep. of the best tight ends in the country. So, I mean, you could go off of that. You could go off something more recent. So I'm, I'm curious to see how they will defend the tight ends because I think that that is going to be a big piece for, uh, for Ben throwing down the field. Oh, it's going to be, you know, the matchup itself is going to be fantastic. I personally, as we're recording this podcast on, on a Wednesday afternoon, can't wait for Saturday. It's going to be awesome. Uh, 1230 ABC, TJ, Thank nationally, God. nationally televised 12. game. 30. Thank that too. goodness. I was, I was pretty, oh I was pretty excited. I was pretty excited for the day game too. Uh, but 1230 <sighs> national TV, it doesn't matter if you're in Jacksonville, Florida, or New York City. It doesn't matter if you've got the rabbit ear television still, TJ. You just yeah. got to turn it to ABC, <laughs> which I think is pretty darn cool in a lot of different aspects for Oregon State. And a big time opportunity uh, for Oregon State to kind of show this program has arrived and we'll see you know how it all shakes out ultimately you know it'll be up to the guys on the field but recruiting uh potential to improve your bowl positioning I've heard some 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 rumors that if Oregon State were to win this game maybe some of the other bigger bowls would look at them as opposed to you know 
what I've said earlier with the glass ceiling of the Sun Bowl seemed like it could not be shattered, but they beat Oregon. I've heard, you know, some other bowls could be more in play. So a lot at stake. It's going to be awesome. TJ, you're going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm so excited. I'm excited. If you want a better bowl, root for USC. That's true. It'll move everyone up. USC going to the college football playoff, as TJ mentioned, absolutely can impact Oregon State going to a better bowl game. So we'll all be keeping tabs on that as well. But for y'all, enjoy your Thanksgiving. Make sure to stay locked to BeaversEdge.com. We're not even close uh, to done with the coverage that we're going to have this week. We'll have, uh, obviously, a a whole bunch of stuff leading up to Saturday's game. We'll have the visitor list, what recruits are going to be on the sideline, Uh, our predictions. TJ's sparkling perfect record is on the line. And, you know, a a whole bunch more uh, content as well. We'll also have uh, some reasons why we think Oregon State can beat the Ducks, too. So Beaver's Edge is going to be the place to be this week. TJ, you and I will both be there at uh, at Austin, or excuse me, at Reister Stadium. How dare I? At Reister Stadium uh, on Saturday. It's going to be an awesome atmosphere. And uh, personally, I can't wait, man. Uh, Excited to see you down there. Yeah, I'm excited, too. Going to have to sit outside, but we'll we'll, we'll do good. I'm, I'm very excited for this. It's going to be fun, no doubt. So, again, Beaver's Edge, or stay tuned to beaversedge.com. We'll be back uh, next week recapping the uh, matchup against Oregon and looking ahead uh, to the postseason. Uh, keep it locked. Beaver's Edge.com will bring you live coverage from Reister Stadium, 1230, Saturday.